Why haven't you received a promotion? Have you stopped cheating on your taxes? Which of your bad habits is the worst? Why aren't you married yet? These are all examples of what we would call loaded questions. There are questions that if you answer either way, you lose. For example, to the, have you stopped cheating on your taxes question? Well, yes, I have stopped cheating on my taxes. You're admitting that you used to. Or, no, I haven't stopped cheating on my taxes. You're admitting to still doing it. Well, in our gospel text today, Jesus is asked a question like this, a question designed to trip him up, designed to get him in trouble no matter how he answers the question. So how does Jesus answer this loaded question that he's asked? See, often when we read this text, we think that Jesus' answer is an actual answer. And we interpret it as him saying, well, that you're supposed to give the things that belong to worldly governments to worldly governments. But if we look at the way Matthew sets up this scenario, it's clear that we shouldn't see Jesus' answer as an answer. It should be a non-answer. After all, the sort of question he's asked is the kind that you're supposed to look bad if you answer it. And Jesus, the text even tells us, knows what's going on. You see, the core of the question that he's asked is whether or not, according to God's law, it's lawful to pay taxes to Caesar. And the reason he's asked that question is because they want to stoke aggression against Jesus. It's the same group of people, well, this time they send their disciples to do their dirty work, but it's the same group of people who he said all of these, these parables that we've been meditating on the last few weeks to. Parables that they perceive after he uses their own words against them are really about them. And this only emboldens them further to seek Jesus' downfall. And so the, the way our text begins is that the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his talk. So they've gotten together and they're coming up with a plan to make Jesus look bad. They've got to take this guy down. He's becoming too popular. He had that crazy triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We have to get rid of him. And so they ask this question. They ask this question because they know that either way that he answers... He's in hot water with one group or another. You see, if Jesus says that, yes, the tax is correct, then he's in trouble with all of the Jews, probably some of the ones who are following him who think the tax is against God's law. And the Pharisees can take advantage of that. But if he answers no and sides with that group, then he's in trouble with the Roman authorities who oversee the Jewish people at this time, and the Pharisees can certainly use that too. Either way, Jesus loses. So Matthew sets up this interaction for us so that we can see that what Jesus says is in fact not an answer to the question at all. You see in verse 15, we start out with a plot to entangle Jesus. He tells us what's going on. Verse 16, then we get some Vain flattery of Jesus, right? They get there, these disciples, and they say, Teacher, we know that you are true and that you teach the way of God truthfully and that you don't care about anybody's opinion, for you're not swayed by appearances. So because we know about all of that for you, tell us, right? Then in verse 18, Matthew tells us that Jesus is aware of what's happening, right? It says, but Jesus, aware of their malice. It's another word for their evil intent. He knows why they're asking the question. And then he accuses them. He basically calls them out. He says, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? So we get a clear picture from Matthew here of what's happening when they ask him this question. And Jesus is not going to get caught in their trap. His response 
sidesteps the snare that's been laid for him. Not only does he get them to acknowledge a partial answer to their question in their own words, by showing them a coin and asking them whose image it bears, but his response doesn't actually answer the core of their question, which is whether or not it's lawful to pay the tax to Caesar according to God's law. Here's his response. Caesar's, they, they answer the question about the coin and says Caesar's. Then he says to them, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. doesn't really get him pinned into a corner. And if you think about the response for the moment, it doesn't make sense as an answer because what would belong to Caesar that doesn't belong to God? Which is really the thrust of the question in the first place. They're trying to figure out what belongs to God according to the tax. Well, I should say, they weren't trying to figure that out, right? The purpose of the question wasn't to find an answer, but was to trick Jesus. But as Jesus normally does, because if you engage in verbal fisticuffs with the Son of God, you don't usually fare too well, he turns it around on them once again. By the end of his response, when he says, the things that that belong to God should be given to God, he's essentially challenging them Again, on this same note, you'll recall, recall the parables that we meditated on. The people that they are representing and their disciples, they are the people who God has placed his people in the care of, right? You remember the tenants of the vineyard? And God has sent prophets and now his son to get what belongs to him, namely his people. And what has their response been? Essentially, it's been, well, they belong to us. And we're going to make sure they belong to us. And here, again, Jesus needles them with this same truth. You say that all this stuff belongs to God, and yet you won't give to God the things that are his. So not only does Jesus give them a clever non-answer, but he gives them a counterattack an accusation, and a question to ponder in the form of a challenge. And it should be quite clear to them what he's saying, because this follows directly on these three interactions they've just had, where each one essentially came down to this truth, that God is looking for you what belongs to him, and you're not giving it. So maybe you don't really think they belong to God, but instead... They belong to you, which, of course, is epitomized in their altercation with Jesus himself. After all, what does God want when he sends Jesus? He wants Jesus to go into Jerusalem to bear the condemnation that you and I and every other disciple of God deserves and die in our place. Now, ironically, the Pharisees also want Jesus to die, but for their own end. Because they think that everything that belongs to God belongs to them instead. They don't recognize the Son of God. So this bears asking the question then, what are the things of God? From the context of our reading today, one answer is quite clear. Israel, God's people, are the things of God. You are... Israel, you have been grafted into the chosen people of God through what Jesus is on his way to do. And so this applies to you as well. There are many terms used to describe what Jesus does on the cross, but in the scriptures, one of the more common themes is that you've been purchased. You've been won. You've been redeemed. And the price for that redemption, the price for that purpose is the death of Jesus. You are. Do not belong to yourself or the world you belong to God. Now, for those of faith, this is wonderful news. In fact, it's one of the core promises of our faith that we cling to in times of sorrow and struggle. 
That's why we in the, in the Lutheran tradition, we point you to your baptism. Because in your baptism, God spoke those very words to you. You are mine. I have bought you with a price. You are mine. What wondrous news that is. Because God has come for you in love. To make you his own. And to give you eternal gifts. The forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. Now, another short and simple answer, which our intro to the service highlighted, is the things that have got, are of God, that's everything. There isn't anything that doesn't belong to God. Which is why when you really think about Jesus' supposed answer, it's not really an answer. Because what belongs to Caesar that doesn't belong to God, first and foremost? So Jesus here is not making some principled statement about the separation of church and state or how as Christians we're supposed to respond to governing authorities in our world, but rather he's pointing to the ultimate authority over all things, God. And he's pointing out to his opponents how they're not honoring this reality, that they're trying to claim for themselves something that does not belong to them. But I think this charge from Jesus to the, to the disciples of the Pharisees should prompt some self-reflection for us as well. It's worth thinking about the things of God. And we might be tempted if we put ourselves in the place of the Pharisees to question, do I render to God the things that are his in my life? And that's certainly a worthwhile thought, but there are some dangers there. Because then you can start to think that your relationship with Jesus depends on whether or not you do the right things. And the gospel's quite clear, that's not the case. So if we really look at this phrase, the things of God, and we understand that it means the people of God, we see that the answer is quite clear. Israel belongs to God. You are part of Israel. So as a people of his own possession whom he goes after in love... We are called not to reject his invitation to the wedding feast. We are called not to inhibit his arrival at his own vineyard. As Lutherans, we say that if you are saved, it's by grace and it's entirely in the fault of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But for some reason, we believe, according to the scriptures, that he allows us to turn away, to turn his offer of grace, his offer of love, his offer of forgiveness away. Don't turn away Jesus. Now you're here this morning because you didn't do that. That by grace the Holy Spirit created faith in you and you received the invitation to the wedding feast. You received the garment of the celebration and you're there. That's why we've gathered here today our little foretaste of the celebration that is to come for eternity in heaven. So you are a people of his own possession. You do belong to him. You are a thing of God. A beloved child. I was thinking about the words the kids were singing in their song. And they say that God is so big, God is so mighty, there's nothing that our God can't do. And the next line is, our God is so big, our God is so mighty, there's nothing he can't make new. That's what he did with you. He made you new. He took you from a thing of this world and made you a thing of God's. He bought you with a price, the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Jesus, in his carefully considered response to his entrapping opponents, sidesteps their trap and puts to them a challenge, a challenge that we should all consider. But a challenge that brings to light the glorious truth of what Jesus is in Jerusalem to do in the first place. To make you new. To make you a thing that belongs to God. So that no matter what happens in this world, that truth remains eternal. The Lord knows what you're dealing with right now. Maybe a time in your life that's great and full of blessings. Or maybe it's a time of hardship and struggle, fear of the unknown, and unanswered questions. This truth remains 
in all those circumstances. A promise given to you in your baptism. A reminder that the worst that could happen to you can no longer happen to you because Jesus took the worst in your place. You are a thing of God, a people of his prized possession. He has chosen you. He has called you by name. You are his. So as Jesus continues onward to the cross, undeterred, to bring about the invitation of the wedding feast to you, his beloved people. Rejoice. Rejoice in this truth. And may it guide you in difficult times to cling to that truth, that reality. In the name of Jesus. Amen.